Good morning. Turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to Romans chapter 8. You are expected to follow me along. Please, get your authorized version of the scriptures and turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to Romans chapter 8. This channel is not monetized, nor never will be. If you click on one of these videos and you see ads, that is not my doing. That is YouTube forcibly putting ads upon the videos that the Lord will do through me on this channel. Okay? I am not monetized. I do not have a thousand subscribers, and I don't need to prove that onto any of you at the dictate of two wicked devils. Okay? Thank you very much. Beg your pardon. Romans chapter 8, verses 29 on to verse 30. Now pay attention. You're going to notice something here. Pay attention. Okay? You got the scriptures? Pay attention. Listen. Okay? Romans chapter 8, verses 29 on to verse 30. For those which he knew before, he also predestinate to be made like to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Wait. Moreover, whom he predestinate, them also he, also he called. And whom he called, them also he justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, if you followed me along in the authorized version of the scriptures, right away you're like, uh, but, hey, hey, whoa, 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 Brad, what, what, you, you're messing up. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? Now let me read from the authorized version of the scriptures. Romans chapter 8, verses 29 on to verse 30. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate them he also called. Note the did. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. You might be asking me by now, oh, Fred, what did you read originally? The Geneva. The Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible. Why are you reading that? And why did you read that? John Calvin had a lot to do with the Geneva Bible. You are hearing me right. The Geneva Bible was one that led on to the perfecting of God's Word in the English language. Right here, God's Word is perfect, inerrant, given by inspiration, found in the English language. Okay? The Geneva Bible came before the authorized version of the Scriptures. But see, the Geneva Bible had study notes. Here, let me, let me show you this. Now, this is actually in Gothic font. Okay? Now, look at that. Okay? You see that? You see these side notes here? These are, with, are, through, are, are without the Geneva Bible. The Geneva Bible are what the Calvinistic Puritans brought over here onto America. Okay? The Geneva Bible is what they had when they came over. Because the Puritans were Calvinistic. Okay? That we need to be uh, remembering about our ancestors. They were Calvinistic and Puritans. Okay? That we need to remember. John Calvin taught what is known as predestination. That from the foundation of the world, he knew that you, Joe, 
He knew and chose you from the, uh, even before the beginning of Genesis chapter 1 that you, Joe, are going to be saved and conformed to the image of his son. Okay? And also, what is the opposite of that? That there are those that are predestinated not to be saved. Okay? So predestination, predestination, as according to Calvin, leads into what? Elect and non-elect. Ah, predestination. Yes. And when you look at in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 on to verse 30, in the authorized version, I'm not going to read out of the... Uh, uh, out, out of Romans chapter 8 here in the uh, Geneva. Um, this is not the big one that the Calvinist goes to, by the way. We know that. But when you look at Romans chapter 8, let's begin at verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. The called, those who are saved. Born again, converted of the church of the living God. For whom he did foreknow. Now here is where it gets a little tricky. Because God does know who is going to be saved and who is going to reject him. Okay? God knows who is going to, who he's going to save and who is going to reject him. Okay? He does know. If he didn't know that, then he wouldn't be God, would he? Okay, don't you, don't get ahead of me. We're, we're, we're going to dive into this quite deeply, okay? But see, God gives people the choice to reject or to accept, okay? God is the one who will save. We do not save ourselves, but yet in his power, he gives a choice. God does, I, I, I always say, God does not hold a gun to your head and force you against your will to be saved. That's what Calvin teaches. Nor does the devil hold a gun to your head forcing you against your will to reject Jesus Christ. No. No. Because if that were the case, then you would be a robot. God does not want a robot. Okay, we're gonna get we're gonna get deeply into this. A uh, brother sent me an email about this, and it was and you're watching. Uh, <laughs> I was already working on it, so it was a confirmation. It's like, okay, <laughs> you know who you are. Thank you, brother. Okay, but like like I said, let's continue this. Okay, in Romans chapter eight, verse twenty nine, for whom he did foreknow. He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Predestinate. The predestination he is, that is being mentioned here is the way of the cross. Okay? We're going to get into that. Okay? We are going to... This is not the big daddy to the Calvinist, by the way. Okay? Predestinate, predestination, uh, predestination I don't think appears, but predestinate appears four times in the scriptures. Twice in Romans and twice in Ephesians, okay? Which leads into elect and non-elect, which branches off into all kinds of things, okay? We're going to get into this, okay? But let's continue. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That predestination is salvation through Christ, Okay? that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Many are called and few are chosen, remember, right? Right? But see, it turns into what it is ultimately an issue of the heart. And many out there say that God knows their heart. And yes, he does. But see, the heart that God wants to know is the one that is broken and contrite. See. Okay? Now, 
Let's get to the Big Daddy. This is the one that, onto the Calvinist, onto the Calvinist. This is the, the Big Daddy. And <laughs> check this out. You go, you're going to know something right away. Turn in your authorized version of the scriptures to Ephesians chapter 1. Two verses. Two verses we're going to look at. In Ephesians chapter 1. Okay? These verses that the Calvinist clings to as far as predestination, this, this is the go-to for them. They go to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 11. Yes, it is mentioned in Romans, but someone who is of the church of the living God can easily, it's like, wait, 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 wait. It's Ephesians that they go to. Now, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Now, I'm going to read to you out of the um, Geneva. You follow along in the authorized version. Hold on to your hats. Okay? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Follow, read, as I read this, follow along in the scriptures. Okay? You tell me. Verse 5 in Ephesians chapter 1. Who hath predestinate us to be adopted through Jesus Christ unto him, Uh, so according, so according to the good pleasure of his will, who hath predestinate us to be adopted through Jesus Christ unto himself, excuse me, according to the good pleasure of his will. The S's are F's in this. Okay, so that's kind of throwing me off. Let me read that again. Verse 5. Who hath predestinate us to be adopted through Jesus Christ unto himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Did you catch that? Having, out of the authorized version, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will, Oh boy, yeah, let's read that. I'm going to read that again out of the uh, uh, Geneva. Who hath predestinate us to be adopted through Jesus Christ unto himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So chosen from the beginning, elect and non-elect. Verse 5 in the authorized version, as you have been following along, you better have. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ unto himself. That predestination is once the Lord saves you. You come to him broken and contrite and he saves you. Okay. You are predestined now to be with the Lord. Okay. You are elect. Because you are saved. Okay. Okay. The election is in salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Greek is a Gentile, okay? Okay? Now, let's look at verse 11. Now, here, here's what's really going <laughs> to... Okay, go to verse 11 in Ephesians chapter 5. Okay? Get a load of this. Okay? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, out of the Geneva Bible. Follow me along in the authorized version. In whom also we are chosen when we were predestinate according to the purpose of him. Yeah. Yeah. You got, you did catch that one right away, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, let me, that, I didn't even finish the verse. Let's, I'm going to read that again. Follow me along. In whom also we are chosen when we were predestinate according to the purpose of him which worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, I'm going to read out the authorized version. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. 
Wow, right? Yeah, yeah. You think, Mr. Calvin, who had a lot to do with the Geneva Bible, put a little of his bent into that? Because when you especially look at verse 11 here in the Geneva Bible, in whom also we are chosen, the scriptures, in whom also we have obtained, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Yeah, yeah. When we were predestinate, being predestinated, being predestinated, what does that mean? That once the Lord saves you, okay, ye are sealed until the day of redemption, okay? That means that you, you, you're going to heaven. No ifs, ands, or buts. You can wreck your life down here being of the church of the living God. You surely can. But your destination is fixed. You're going to heaven. And the, also, as in regards to Romans chapter 8, the predestination that is being referred to is the way of the cross. See? Okay? We're going to get into this quite deeply, so don't worry about it. Stay with me on this, okay? But those are the two appearances of predestination. Okay? And that, as I said, came out of the Geneva Bible. This is what our American ancestors, the Puritans, brought over on the Mayflower. The authorized version was available, but they brought this. Hence, Calvinism, the problem of Calvinism. John Calvin, uh, the in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, which I have, okay, um, he did he had some good things, but the elect and non-elect, his predestination thing, that's the big thing to the Calvinist. Here I got, can you see this? The Baptist Confession of Faith from 1689. This is Puritan. Okay, and if you get this and read this, it talks about elect and non-elect, okay, being predestinated. The Puritans were Calvinistic Baptist, pretty much, okay? There is such a thing as Baptist and Calvinistic Baptists, okay? That's this. Calvin had a lot to do with this. Uh, his uh, teachings influenced this. Also, you see this? The Westminster Confession of Faith. Okay? Also, deeply Calvinistic with elect and non-elect using the term sacrament. Sacrament. Sacrament is not in the authorized version of the scriptures. Okay? That's Catholic. Okay? And also, here, here's one that's really interesting. The Helderberg Catechism, also Calvinistic. Very Calvinistic. Also uses the word uh, sacrament and stuff like that. Okay? Brethren, we have to remember something about the Reformers. God used the Protestant Reformation. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He sure did. Amen. Else, the Protestant Reformation brought about getting the scriptures into the common tongue. Okay? That's what that was there for. Okay? And now that we have the scriptures in the common tongue, and incidentally, I have to address this, um, when it comes to translating the scriptures into whatever tongue it is, which language does someone have to learn? For the common people, you know, like people like myself, no, no, and I have never said, I have never said that they had to learn English. For the common people, translate the scriptures into their tongue. As I have always said, use the authorized version as your base text. That is what I have said. That's what I believe, 
okay? I don't care if they did it that way in history or not. I personally believe that you use the authorized version to translate into other tongues, okay? And then the circular argument comes about. It's like, well, in English, there are certain words in English that don't um, go over into other tongues. Same with the Hebrew and the Greek. So see, a circular argument about that arises. If the Lord is going to use someone to translate his word into someone's, uh, into their native tongue, the common folk like myself, does that mean that they have to learn English, Hebrew, or Greek? No, but uh, someone probably would be beneficial onto that person who is doing the translating to be aware of the language, at least, that he's translating from into his common tongue. So which one is it? Which one do you have to go to? The Greek, the Hebrew, or the English? Which one? See, that's a dangerous circular argument there. You run in circles. And then, okay, when it comes to the Hebrew and the Greek, which one of those? Okay? Which edition? I guess the Nesalalan is up to 28 or something like that? Huh? Or do you use the Septuagint? Which edition of the Hebrew? And then when it comes to the Texas Receptus, do you know that there's 18 or 19 editions of that? Renderings of that? You know that? So which one? Which one? The one from Syria or the one from Antioch? And then once you choose a side, which one? I thank the Lord God, our Father, Jesus Christ, that he has given us his perfect word in the English language for English-speaking people. You take this and translate this into someone else's tongue. And if someone's going to translate it into someone else's tongue, uh, the person doing the translating would have to probably be aware of how to at least read that, not the common people. And then, then someone, some might say, well, which edition of the authorized version? I wipe my hands of you then. Okay, which one, right? The 1611 or the 1769? Go away. Go away. Go away. Yea, hath God said. Go away with that. Okay? Go away. Circles. Circles. I ain't playing that. So, I had to address that, brethren. Please forgive me. If that irritates some of you, I'm sorry. I said, I've made my choice, boy. And if, uh, if you're of another nation, use this to translate into your tongue if that is what the Lord has called you to do. Use this. I personally have always believed that the Greek and the Hebrew, okay, that was there to give us this. This is the finished product. Sure, go to the Hebrew and the Greek if you want to, okay? I personally believe and teach. Here it is. You use this, okay? I've, I've addressed this several times. That's the last time I'm going to address that, so never mind. Forgive that rabbit trail. Now, let's get to the topic at hand about Calvinism. See, predestination that Calvin taught teaches elect and non-elect, that there are those that are chosen without their will to go to heaven, and that there are those chosen to go to hell without their will, no matter what they do, elect and non-elect, which they get from predestination. So we're going to look at elect, okay? Get your authorized version of the scriptures. We're going to the very first mention of the word elect, okay? Now there are variations of the word elect, and I have them all written down. We're not going all through them. But um, the first mention, Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42 in your authorized version. Isaiah chapter 42. Here is the very first mention of elect. And you're going to note right away unto whom it is speaking. Okay? 
We will read verses 1 on to verse 4. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, and whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. He shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isle shall wait for his law. Who is that talking about? The Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? His elect. My servant, whom I uphold, mine elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. Him. Not Israel. Him. The Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Okay? In whom my soul delighteth. The soul of the Godhead is the Father. Jesus Christ. Spirit, soul, and body. The Word made flesh. The body. Our Lord Jesus Christ. God the Father is the soul. The Holy Ghost is the spirit. Spirit, soul, and body. One God. Okay? Not three divine persons that make one God. Okay? This is talking about Jesus Christ. God our Father. Okay? So the very first mention of elect has to do with who? Jesus Christ. But let's, let's look again, okay? Now go to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45. Okay? Isaiah chapter 45, also verses 1 under verse 4. Okay? Isaiah chapter 45, verses 1 under verse 4. We have to deal with the elect thing because when it comes to Calvinistic teaching of predestination, it bleeds into elect and non-elect. Chosen, chosen. Going to heaven without their uh, choice, going to hell without their choice. That's the issue of Calvinism. Okay? That's the thing. They twist predestination to elect and non-elect. Okay? So we have to address this thing of election. It is imperative. Okay? Let's continue. Isaiah chapter 45, verses 1 under verse 4. Thus said the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will lose the loins of kings, to open before him the two leave gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Now Cyrus was the one who allowed the children of Israel to go back after the captivity. You read that in Ezra and Nehemiah, okay? There were many out there of the care Catholics who said that Trump had the Cyrus anointing. <laughs> Catholics. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, Cyrus fulfilled this in Ezra and Nehemiah, okay, in the book of Ezra, okay? That was fulfilled, okay? Let's continue. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches in secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect. Now right here, Israel, mine elect. Israel, Jacob, the Jew. Okay, right there, plain as day, context. <gasps> context. Elect right there is referring on to who? Israel. Who is Israel? Jacob. Who is Jacob? They're the Jews. Okay? And as we looked at in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, the elect, who is that talking about? Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Okay? So, you mean elect? The definition of the word elect 
is dependent on the context which it appears. Verse 4, sorry. For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. Israel is his elect. And he's talking to Cyrus. And Cyrus allowed the children of Israel to go back into uh, to Jerusalem. Okay? You read about that in the book of Ezra. Okay? And at the end of Second Chronicles. Okay? And it's very interesting to note, when you look into the Tanakh, the, um, the Jewish translation, the J JPS translation of the uh, Old Testament scriptures, the Jewish Bible is not set up according to the kingdom of heaven. In the Jewish Bible, the last book is Second Chronicles. And they are told in the very last book of the Jewish Bible to return unto Jerusalem, to Israel. Keep that in mind, okay? Because the Jewish Bible that is available, the JPS, is not set up in accordance to the kingdom of heaven, okay? The authorized version of the scriptures. This Jewish book is, okay? So we see two different occurrences of elect, right? One is speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ and the apple of God's eye, Israel, the Jew. And boy, Catholics hate that. They hate that. Okay? Now let's look at the also the other appearances. There are two here in Isaiah chapter 65. Okay? Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65 verse 9 and verse 22. Okay? Isaiah 65, verse 9. Uh, let's re read verses 8 under verse 10. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sakes, that I may not destroy them all, and I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor of my mountains. Now, note it says seed, singular, of Jacob and out of Judah, an inheritor, singular. Salvation is of the who? The Jews. Jesus Christ, God our Father, is of who? The Jews. Jesus Christ is Jewish. And mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. What is that inheritance being referenced here in verse 9? The kingdom of heaven. What is the kingdom of heaven? The one that's in Jerusalem. And what does it say there in verse 8 or in verse 9? And my servants, those who serve the Lord Jesus Christ, in the kingdom of heaven, shall dwell there. Okay? So the elect right there, and mine elect shall inherit it. Mine elect. Who is that talking about? Those who follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And also, our Lord Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. See? Do you get it? And look at verse 10. And Sharon shall be a fold of flocks and the valley of Achor a place for the herds to lie down in. For my, for my people that have sought me. Do you see that? So elect there mean, could mean both of two things. Our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, when he come back at his second coming towards the end of the, uh, at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, Okay, he's going to rule and reign from Jerusalem. And those who are saved and those that make it out of the time of Jacob's trouble are going to rule and reign with him in Jerusalem. Okay, do you get it? 
And now let's look at verse 22. Verse 22. Verse 22. Um, let me see. Where should we begin for the context? Let's begin at verse 17. On to verse 22. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people, the Jews, the Jews. My people, the Jews. Remember, dear friend, we the Gentiles in this dispensation are grafted into the tree of the Jew to make them jealous. That's what Romans 11 is about. If I can remember, I'll try to put that thing about replacement theology, those two videos, in this uh, video, okay? Okay? We the Gentile have been brought into the tree of the Jew to make them jealous. The Jew is the apple of God's eye. Okay? Let's continue. Okay. Verse 19 again. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not fulfilled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the days of a tree are the days of my people, and mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands, making reference to those who are in the millennial kingdom because, excuse me, the kingdom of heaven. Because the kingdom of heaven is about works. And what does it say there? And my mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Mine elect. The apple of God's eye. See, God dealing with Jew and Gentile today in this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles ends with the redemption of the purchased possession, the catching away of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? Now, very interesting, let's go to Matthew. We're not going to go through all the references of elect. We are going to hit quite a few references of elect in uh, the Pauline epistles. Because remember, in this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles, it is to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. Jew and Gentile. Okay? But under the dispensation of the law and the Old Testament, before this dispensation, it was for the Jew. And very interesting, in the Gospel accounts. Guess where the word elect appears first in the four gospel accounts? Go ahead, guess. Matthew chapter 24. Yeah, go figure that, right? Matthew chapter 24. Now, remember, Matthew chapter 24 is describing the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? And our Lord is addressing who in Matthew chapter 24? Who is he addressing? The Jews. Okay? The Jews. Okay? So, keeping that in mind, and also, Matthew chapter 24 is before the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hence, 
still the Old Testament, hence still under the law, because the perfect sacrifice for sins was not yet made with the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood on the cross. Okay? Okay? So, Matthew chapter 24, verse 22. Okay? <clears throat> Matthew chapter 22. Well, actually, let's read verse... Um, Verse 19 on to verse 22 for a little bit of context in Matthew chapter 24. Verses 19 on to verse 22 in Matthew chapter 24. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Paul and epistles, by the way, are the doctrine specifically for all of us, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile, uh, are specific doctrines for us today in this dispensation, the time of the Gentiles, okay? Keeping the Sabbath is not a requirement for salvation or to, be, or to stay saved, okay? It's not a requirement. Should the Jew remember and keep the um, Sabbath? It's not necessary for their salvation. It's not necessary for you to be saved or stay saved. If you want to keep the Sabbath, go right ahead. It's not a requirement for us today. Okay? Because this is the time of the Gentiles. We have been grafted into your tree to make you jealous. Okay? The Sabbath day pertains unto the Jew. Okay? Let's continue. For then shall be great tribulation. There is no the in front of that, by the way. Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Sabbath day, the elect. He's speaking to Jews. This is talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. Context. Elect means who? The Jews. Okay? Do you see how it's uh, by context? Oh, but wait, 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 wait. Now go to verse 24. We'll read 23 on to verse 24. Then... If any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall shew great signs and wonders, and so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Elect, again, making reference unto who? The Jews. Okay? The church of the living God is not being talked about within Matthew chapter 24, dear people. You must understand that. You have to rightly divide the word of truth. Okay? Now, let's skip over to verse 29 on to verse oh, 35. Okay? Verse 29 on to verse 35 in Matthew chapter 24. Immediately, beginning at verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Talking about his second coming. Okay? And he shall send his angels with the great sound of the trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect 
from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other, his elect, the Jews, he sends out his angels to, it's like, come on, okay? It's not a second catching away. That's not what that is. I have a video where I uh, explain that, so I'm not going to get off on that. I can't remember which one, but if the Lord give me remembrance, I'll put it in this video, okay? But let's continue. Now, very interesting. Note here, gather his elect, talking about the Jews. Look at verse 32. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. The parable of the fig tree. The fig tree is synonymous with the Jew, okay? When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall, shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So again, elect is speaking unto whom? The Jew. The Jew. Okay? Now, let's go to the Pauline epistles, back to Romans chapter 8. Now, this is after the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is this current dispens uh, dispensation. Okay? Romans chapter 8. Let's begin at verse 28. Okay? Here's the first appearance of elect within the Pauline epistles. And you know what? Before we read this, let's go back to, let's go to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Verse 16. Verse 16. Romans chapter 1. Let's, let's preface this with this. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. A Greek is a Gentile. Jew and Greek. Jew and Gentile. Okay? Now, go back to Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 28, on to verse 33. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say? What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. Jew and Gentile. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. So, okay. In context, who is elect talking about? Those who are predestinated. What is the predestination? The cross. The way of the cross. The death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. When the Lord saves you, when you come to him broken and contrite, guess what? You are part of the elect. Because God has elected that to save all who would come to him, broken and contrite. 
So elect right there in context, dear friends, refers to what? The church of the living God, which is comprised of Jew and Gentile. Okay? Well, hold on. We're going to reference Galatians. Okay? Hold up. Hold up. We're driving this home. Okay? We are driving this home. Now, go to Romans chapter 9. <clears throat> Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Let's read from verse 9 on to verse 13. In Romans chapter 9. Verses 9 on to verse 13. For this is the word of promise. At this time will I come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. Election. The purpose of God according to election. What is that talking about? Election. The way of the cross. The death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Okay? That's what that is referring to. And note that it says, but of him that calleth. God has chosen the way of the cross. Okay? The death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. You come to him on his terms, broken and contrite. And cry out to him in brokenness, contrition, and fear. And it says, Whoso ever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God will save you. It's his decision. After all. But see, it's an issue of the heart. You have to come to him on his terms not your own. Okay? Because it says here, verse 12, It was said unto her, The elder shall serve the younger, as it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Yes, God hates people who reject him. God's wrath is, against, is for you if you reject the gospel. If you reject what God did for you after all that you have done to him. Okay? Do you get that? Now, there are also many other references that we can get to. But let's go to Romans chapter 11 now. Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Okay? Romans chapter 11. Verses, uh, let's begin in verse 4. And we will read on to verse 7. Okay, check this out. Romans chapter 11. But what saith the answer of God unto him? Talking about Elisha. I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time, also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. The election of grace. Hold up. And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. What is election talking about in verse 5 and 7? Again, this current dispensation, the way of the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? God chose this way 
Okay? He chose this way. That is the election. Okay? And there be few who find it. Today, in this dispensation, there are very few Jewish people who are saved, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Because today, a Jew comes to their Messiah through the witness of the Church of the Living God to make them jealous, okay? You Jewish people out there, you tell me you're jealous over what you see going on in the church building system. You tell me you're jealous over that. Hmm? You tell me, Jew, that you are. Hi. You tell me that you're Jewish about what you equate to being Christian through the Roman Catholic Church, your true enemy. God chose this way. Not the way of the law. He chose this. God chooses. Hmm. Hmm. Very interesting. Now, let's go to verse 28. Okay? Let's go to verse 28. Context, okay? Let's read now verse 25 on to verse 29. Now, in Romans chapter 11. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. The fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel... They are enemies for your sakes, us Gentiles. But as touching the election that the Jew is and always will be, the apple of his eye, they are beloved for the, right there, Father's sake. Right there. Beloved for the Father's sake. The fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But as touching the election, the Jew is the apple of God's eye. We've been grafted in. They are beloved for the Father's sake. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you see? For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. What does that mean? The Jew is the apple of God's eye. No matter what. Okay? No matter if someone wants to try to replace them, the fact of Scripture, the truth of the matter is, the Jew is the apple of God's eye. Okay? Okay? Now, the way of the cross. Go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Okay? The way of the cross that God would be manifest in the flesh, die, bury, and rise again the third day according to the scriptures and shed his blood on the cross to atone for sins was given to us in, Rev, uh, Gen uh, in Genesis chapter 3. Okay, Go to Genesis chapter 3. Now, the book of Revelation explains about this. And if I can remember, I will try to put that an expository video on Revelation chapter 12. Did I say 3? Excuse me. Revelation chapter... Revelation chapter 13. I beg your pardon. Forgive me. Getting tongue-tied here. Uh, I get into it very deeply in that video, but go to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Now here is the first prophecy and mention of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, okay? Meaning of the way of the cross. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, thee and the woman, 
Who is he talking to? The, the serpent. Who is the serpent? Satan. And the woman. Who is the woman? Talking about Eve? But when you read Revelation chapter 13, the woman is Israel. Yes, yes, yes. So in fulfillment, I will put enmity between thee, Satan, and the woman, Israel. And between thy seed, Mystery Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church, and her seed, Israel. And, I sh and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Who is the seed of the woman? Our Lord Jesus Christ came of the Jew, Israel. And you can prove that by looking at that verse. It shall bruise thy head, the head of Roman Catholicism, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It's talking about our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? It's talking about our Lord Jesus Christ. The way of the cross, right there. That out of Israel, the Savior would come. The woman there, and like I said, that uh, Revelation chapter 13, 12 or 13 it is. I can't remember right offhand. Um, one second. Okay, sorry. I will put the expository video for Revelation chapter 12. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Please forgive me for that. But I will put the expository study video for Revelation chapter 12 in the description box, which where we go into this, okay? But the way of the cross was be, uh, chosen from the beginning, okay? And the seed is our Lord Jesus Christ, the woman is Israel, okay? Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 is the very first prophecy of such. And now go to Exodus. Exodus chapter 12, okay? Exodus chapter 12. Come on, fingers. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 on to verse 23. Exodus chapter 12, verse 21 on to verse 23. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to the family, according to your families, and kill the Passover. A lamb. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop. Didn't they take a bunch of hyssop onto our Lord Jesus Christ and offered it to him with uh, wine and vinegar or vinegar of wine? And dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel, the top of the door, and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of, the, of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, top two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door. Is not our Lord Jesus Christ the door? And will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. Okay? But go back now hold, uh, to Genesis chapter 22. Notice how it says here in verse 22, and take you a lamb according to your families. According to your families. Genesis chapter 22. And uh, verse 8. Genesis chapter 22, verse 8. Not 21, Brad. Verse 8, cha uh, Genesis chapter 22. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. 
So they went, both of them, together. Now, the Bibles of today mess this up and play it into the Catholic satanic teaching of the Trinity. One God consisting of three persons. A person is a spirit, soul, and body. When the Godhead is spirit, soul, and body. The Holy Ghost is the spirit. God the Father is the soul. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh, is the body. Okay? God will provide himself a lamb. And over here in Exodus chapter 12, it says to draw out and take you a lamb and put the blood on the lintel and the two side posts. Okay? Go to now Leviticus chapter 17. Leviticus chapter 17. Okay? Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. He'll see the blood. He'll pass over. God will provide himself a lamb. Enmity between thy seed and her seed. Thy seed, Satan's seed. The Roman Catholic Church, God's seed, Israel, of whence our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, God manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, came of. So you see, from the very beginning, that is what our Lord chose. But go now to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. People are out there saying, well, they were looking forward to the cross from the very beginning. We'll get to that. Okay? I've already covered that before, but for the sake of this, we will get to it again. John chapter 1, verse 29. Remember what we looked at in Genesis and Exodus? About the lamb that taketh away sin of the world? In Genesis chapter 22, verse 8, God will provide himself, one God, spirit, soul, and body. John chapter 1, verse 29, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And, oh, and, and, and verse 36 in John chapter 1, uh, let's uh, let's look at verse 35 and 36. Again the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. God will provide himself a Lamb, the Father in flesh. Okay? Not one of three divine persons. That's heresy. That's what Roman Catholicism teaches you. Satan's seed. Okay? And also, again, about the blood. You know, the blood on the lintel and the side posts. You know, the lintel and the side posts. You get that visualization, don't you? Yeah, you do. Okay? Go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Okay? Come on. Fingers work with me. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 on to verse 22. Not Philippians, Brad, what are you doing? <laughs> Colossians chapter 1, verses 16 on to verse 22. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, 
and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. See, the predestination is the cross, and then upon the death, burial, and resurrection, and the shedding of blood to atone for our sins, okay, we who are saved are sealed. We have God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Lord is that Spirit living within us, okay? Hence, we are part of him. He is part of us. We are his bones and his flesh, the body of Christ, the church of the living God. See, that is the predestination. Okay? This is what the Lord has chosen. This is what the Lord has chosen for today, for this dispensation. Okay? And once... We are saved, sealed, born again. Okay? Our destination is determined to be with the Lord. We are predestined to be with him. Do you get it? It's not that he chose you personally from the beginning of the world. No, he chose the way of the cross from the beginning of the world. And the statutes to come onto that. See, by grace, through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works. The works of the law. Lest any man should boast. Okay. Let's continue. For it pleased the Father that in him all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross... By him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. And, you know, while we're here, Galatians, because I said that, okay, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 on to verse 29. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 on to verse 29. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And now go to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 on to verse 10. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 on to verse 10. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declared unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So you see from the very beginning, the way of the cross was what our Lord chose for us today. That God manifest in the flesh would come, 
die, bury, and rise again the third day according to the scriptures, and shed his perfect blood on the cross that cleanseth us from all sin. Okay? That was chosen from the very beginning. That was what was predestined. Okay? But see now, here's another thing that comes up. Okay? The rejection of that. The rejection. And this plays into the free will thing. Okay? Because the Calvinist teaches that you don't have a say in it. That you've been chosen from the beginning of the world. When we have already seen that the way of the cross was chosen from the beginning of the world. And by grace through faith eventually to come, but it wasn't revealed until Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 7, but the rejection, the rejection, okay, the rejection. Go to Isaiah chapter 53, okay? Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Let's read this. Isaiah chapter 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of their Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. Dry ground, tie that in with the fig tree of Israel. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him... There is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Rejected of men. Rejected of men. Really? You mean people had a choice? You mean that the Lord knew that he was going to be rejected? And he did it anyway? Really? Let's continue. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Um, by the way, if you can't figure this out, that this is clearly talking about our Lord Jesus Christ and not the nation of Israel. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shears is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. Brought before Pilate. He kept silence. Even before Herod. I think it was Herod, yes. He didn't say anything. Excuse me. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? <laughs> he sure did. A generation of vipers. And he was taken from prison and from judgment. It was a fixed trial. For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. My people, Israel. Remember, salvation is of the Jews. He came of Israel, the Jew. He is Jewish. Of the seed, the woman's seed. The woman's seed is Israel. 
and he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence neither was any deceit in his mouth he never sinned because God cannot sin it is impossible for God to sin yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him he hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin he shall see his seed he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand giving credence unto the current dispensation after the death burial and resurrection he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many for he shall bear their iniquities therefore will I divide him a portion with the great and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors so what we have seen so far look at verse 3 again he is despised and rejected of men so now according to Calvinism the elect and non-elect that they are chosen from the beginning to be saved and they are chosen from the beginning to go to hell but it says rejected of men what does that imply that implies choice doesn't it that implies that the Lord isn't holding a gun to your head making you to do something it also implies that Satan isn't holding a gun to your head making you to do something doesn't it and we have to touch this go to Matthew chapter 16 now okay Matthew chapter 16 verses 21 on to verse 28 Matthew chapter 16 verses 21 on to verse 28 From that time forth, now we're getting into again, people will say, okay, Brad, you're saying that the cross was predestined from the beginning. They were looking forward to the cross all the way back in Genesis. Matthew chapter 16, verses 21, on to the close of the chapter. From that time forth began Jesus to shew unto his disciples how that he must go on to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Okay? God, we already looked at that in Isaiah chapter 53. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Oh, Peter, right? Saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Now, they were looking forward to the cross all the way back from Genesis okay that they were okay he he set that in motion in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 the way of the cross was set into motion all the way back there but it wasn't revealed okay they were not looking forward to the cross but he turned and said unto Peter get thee behind me Satan Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. You would think that the first pope should have known that, but he didn't. Because they weren't looking forward to the cross all the way back in the Old Testament. He was despised and rejected of men. They didn't desire their Messiah. Prophesied. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto you, There be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming 
in his kingdom. And verse 28 was fulfilled when our Lord Jesus Christ uh, rode upon an ass and came into Jerusalem and they were laying palm tree things down. That was fulfilled when he came into his kingdom. Okay? And now go to John, uh, Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. Our Lord Jesus Christ got our Father on the cross. Okay? Matthew chapter 27, verses 40 under verse 44. Remember what we read in Isaiah chapter 53? Oh, let's begin at verse 39 under verse 44. Excuse me. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. It was, they had no desire for their Messiah, for God their Father, the Lord Jesus Christ crucified, naked, bloodied. His visage was so marred, that above any man, his form, than the sons of man. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. And saying, Thou that destroyest the temple, and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief, the chief priests, mocking him, with the scribes and elders, said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down, let him come not let him now come down from the cross. And we will believe him. Because the Jews require a sign, remember. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes should have known that the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, is their promised Messiah. But they didn't. Because they weren't looking forward to the cross. They should have known this, but they didn't. They rejected their Messiah. And let's drive this home. John chapter 1. John chapter 1. John chapter... Come on, fingers. John chapter 1. Verses 10 on to verse 13. John chapter 1, verses 10 on to verse 13. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, the Jews, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So he was rejected. He was rejected. Now, some of you might be asking, it, it doesn't make sense. If God knew that he was going to be rejected. Why would he still offer it? If God knew that his own were going to reject him, why would he still offer it? Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? What? What? You think it, uh, uh, what is that? <clears throat> uh, Psalm 50, verse 21. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such and one as thyself. But I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. You're like, I wouldn't have offered that. If I knew ahead of time that they were going to reject everything I did, but yet he still offered it, even though he knows that they were going to reject it, but yet he still offered it. Uh, 
Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself, huh? Psalm 50. Read that on your own time. Go to Psalm, while we're here, go to Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who, these are the benefits, forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. People like to take this and uh, twist that into uh, soul annihilationism like uh, Bollinger does. We're not going to get off on that. Who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies. Who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses his acts unto the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He hath not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Now you think about that in verse 10. God has every right in his anger to say unto this earth, this planet, I'm done with you, Psst, we're done. But see, that's long suffering. That's God's long suffering. And for the sake of his body, the church of the living God, you lost people. You ain't going to make it this long. But if you do, good. It's God's long suffering and his mercy that he has given you today. Because he would have all men to be saved. We're going to look at that, Mr. Calvinist. Um, once we, the church of the living God, get caught up, the redemption of the purchased possession, you're going to have to deal with Roman, uh, Roman Catholicism, Mystery Babylon. You have to choice. God is the one who saves you. He's drawing you. Are you going to accept a, accept his invitation? Or are you going to be hard hearted? Let's continue. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. Like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, and remembereth that we are dust. Thank the Lord for his long-suffering and mercy. Because we are mere dust and ashes. I praise the Lord that his ways are not our ways. Because if they were, oh! I, I, I praise the Lord that his ways are that much more higher than fallible man. Know what I'm saying? And whether you want to admit it or not, the time will come when you will acknowledge, yeah, hopefully it won't be too late for you. Verse 15, as for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field, so he flourisheth. For the wind passeth over it, and it is gone, and the place thereof shall know, shall know it no more. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting upon them that fear him, and his righteousness unto children's children. To such as keep his covenant, and those that remember his commandments to do them. 
The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his, that do his pleasure. Bless the Lord, all his works, and all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Isaiah chapter 55. Isaiah chapter 55. We can't fathom the long suffering of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. We can't fathom his grace. God the Father, the greater, showing, showing mercy unto the lesser. The greater shewing unmerited favor on the lesser. And all he wants is the lesser to cry out to the greater in humbleness, brokenness, and sorrow, which is the fear of the Lord, wisdom. Isaiah 55, verses 6 unto verse 11. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Right now, in this dispensation, it's easy to get saved. you just got to get over yourself. And he'll do that. He'll break you. But he ain't forcing you, see. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. But you think he's one altogether like you? See, that's the problem. You make God into an image of your making, not the God who is, is of the authorized version of the scriptures. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Why would God, in long-suffering and mercy, offer the kingdom of heaven unto his own people who knew he would, they would reject it? Um, instead of asking why, dear friend, have fear and come to him broken of yourself knowing that he died because of what you did to him. That it was your sin that put him on that cross. I, I've, I've run into so many people. It's like, when I get before God, I'm going to ask this, this. No, oh, no, you ain't. No, you ain't. John fell down at his feet as dead. You read that in the book of Revelation. Beg your pardon. The longer you walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and are of his church, the body of Christ, the church of the living God, um, the questions of the why go away in that regard. You learn to trust on the Lord and to be thankful and to, be, and to fear him. 
Why did he do that? His long suffering, his mercy, because he's God. His ways are not our ways. Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57, verse 15 on to verse 21. For thus saith uh, Isaiah 57, verse 15 on to verse 21. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place. With him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. To, re to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Contrition is sorrow. For I will not contend forever, neither will I always, neither will I be always wrong. Why? For the spirit should fail before me and the souls which I have made. There's going to come a time lost person that you're going to be thankful that the Lord gave you all these opportunities and you didn't take them and see it would be easy for you to fall into Calvinism right because well I'm elect and then you got these hyper Calvinists who say well since I'm elect uh, going to heaven without any, I don't need to pray or anything right Gee, who says you don't need to pray? <laughs> if you pray, just thank God for saving you because you mentally believe by what you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I raw, and I smote him, I hid me, and was raw. And he went on frowardly in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will lead him also and restore comforts unto him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace. Peace to him that is afar off. That is far off. Excuse me. And to him that is near, saith the Lord. And I will heal him. But the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. His ways are not our ways. God knows what's going to happen before it happens. But see, he's just. His ways are not our ways. Shall not the judge of all the world do right? of all the earth. Do right. That's what Abraham said unto the Lord himself. See, if he didn't offer, would he be just? Even if he knew, even when he knew that his people were going to reject him, that there be few who will be saved, but yet he still offers. All day long, I offer my hand unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. His ways are not our ways. Instead of burdening yourself with the why, dear friend, you better consider this Jesus, who is God the Father. And don't become proud thinking that you're one of the elect. Because ultimately, doesn't that lead to what? Pride. I'm elect. And you're not. And the Calvinistic teachers of today, like MacArthur and his little uh, buddy, John, uh, Justin Peters. huh? See, they're preaching because there are those out there, according to the Calvinists, who don't know that they're the elect or non-elect. The predestination, as Calvin taught, is heresy. Because God would have all men to be saved. John chapter 12. 
John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Verses 30 on to verse 33. Jesus answered and said, The voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world, Satan, be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw the elect according to Calvinism unto me. Will draw all men unto me. This he said signifying what death he should die. Meaning the cross, which was prophesied all the way back in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 and given subtle hints of it. But they weren't looking forward to it, remember. It wasn't revealed until after. After the death burial and resurrection. But it says here, we'll draw in verse 32. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, crucified, will draw all men onto me. Go back to Isaiah chapter 49. Isaiah chapter 49. Ah, oh, wow, wow. What are you doing, Brad? Isaiah chapter 49. Let's read verses 1 on to verse 6 in Isaiah 49. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people far from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, Jehovah saves. And he hath made my mouth like a sharp Sword. A sword proceedeth out of his mouth in the book of Revelation. Who is this talking about, I wonder? In the shadow of his hand hath he hidden me and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. Quiver, where he puts his arrows, hid me. Meaning it wasn't revealed until much later. They weren't looking forward to the way to the cross all the way back in the Old Testament. They weren't. Here's more proof in the Old Testament. Okay. And said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet surely my judgment is with the Lord and my work with my God. And now, saith the Lord, that formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob, Israel, again to him. Though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. And he said, It is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant, to rise up, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. So right there, verse 6, is a prophecy about us Gentiles being grafted into the tree of the Jew to make them jealous. Do you see that? It was prophesied but not revealed, especially about us Gentiles in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 1 on to verse 7. Okay? So, having all men to be saved, Jew, is the apple of his eye, his chosen people, and Gentile, who are of the elect when 
the Lord saves you and seals you and are of the church of the living God, both of Jews and Gentiles. See, the election is the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you get it? First Timothy. First Timothy chapter two. First Timothy chapter two. <laughs> Verses four on verse six. No, 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 no. Verses one on verse six in First Timothy chapter two. I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority. Why? That we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. Very quickly, is that available for us today through the Jesuit-controlled government in America? <laughs> For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have only the elect according to Calvinism to be saved. <laughs> who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. Semiramis, the Blessed Virgin Mary. No. The man, Christ Jesus. The man, Christ Jesus. Who gave himself a ransom for the elect only according to Calvinism. No. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Meaning it wasn't revealed until later, until Paul, that the Gentile would be grafted into the tree of the Jew to make the Jew jealous to bring them back on to their God, to our testimony, not the testimony of Roman Catholicism and all her Jesuit coadjutors. And let's go to Second Pete. Second, Second Peter. Second Peter chapter three. Verses eight on to verse nine. In Second Peter chapter three. Ow. Beg your pardon. But beloved. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God would have all men to be saved. He knows that there are people out there who are going to reject. But yet, in his long-suffering and mercy, he still offers. It's there. He is drawing so many, but he's not going to force his salvation upon you. Because you would be a robot. He wants you to choose him. And what Mr. Calvin does is take that out of the equation. Hence why people like MacArthur and Peters are so hip on saying slave. When it's servant.
Beware of John MacArthur and Justin Peters. That wretched radio guy, too. That free hole or whatever his name is. Beware of these people. God would have all men to be saved. But, you know, let's now, the choice, the choice, the choice thing. Go to Numbers chapter 17. Here, here, here it is. Numbers chapter 17. Numbers chapter 17. Who chooses? God has chosen the way of the cross. I believe that has already been proven to you from the very beginning. Okay? But we have to remember, we don't save ourselves. It is God who does the saving. Look at uh, Numbers chapter 17, verse 5. And it shall come to pass that the man's rod whom I shall choose shall blossom, and I will make to cease from me the murmurings of the children of Israel, whereby they murmur against you. So God chooses. So God chooses. Go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Do to, go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 and verse 8. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people. For ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Remember? Hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen and from, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt? Who does the saving? Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30. Moses talking. I call uh, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. I, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. That both thou and thy seed may live. God's not forcing you to choose him. Even back here. There's a part in here where um, he said, Oh, that they would consider their latter end. One second, I'm going to find that. Hold on, one second. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter... Oh, okay. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Verse 29. Oh, that they were wise. Wisdom is the fear of the Lord. That they understood, and to depart from evil is understanding. Understood this. That they would consider their latter end. And how many of you out there aren't considering your latter end? You think God forces things on you as far as salvation, your choice? He gives you the choice. He's the one who saves you. But he ain't forcing you. Joshua. Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24. 
Joshua chapter 24. Verse 14 on to verse 15. Joshua chapter 24, verse 14 on to verse 15. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods, little g, which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto, unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Second Timothy, chapter two, uh, actually, Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. Acts chapter 18. Verses one on to verse six. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. They opposed themselves and blasphemed. 2 Timothy chapter 2, again. Or, yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 2, not again, excuse me. We went to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 on to verse 26. Now let's read verses 23 on to verse 26. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle on to all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance, to the acknowledging of the truth. Oppose themselves. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Whom are taken captive by him at his will. Oppose themselves. How is that? By rejection. By rejection. Because why? For Psalm 34 again. Or did we already go there? No, we did not. Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Verse 18. The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. A broken heart. A broken heart is a heart that is broken of self-righteousness. You cannot be self-righteous and come unto the Lord. Uh, once the Lord saves you, yes, you're going to still struggle with your pride. Hello, I do. But you do not come to the Lord for him to save you thinking that you're a good person. You have to be broken of that. And uh, what does it say there? The Lord is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart, broken of your self-righteousness, and save us such as be of a contrite spirit. Sorrowful. Okay? 
Okay, and of course, Psalm 51, I already got, I got a, an expository video on this one. Psalm 51, verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. O God, thou wilt not despise. See, you have to come to the Lord broken and contrite. Those are his terms. You skip over that. Coming in your self-righteousness. Well, I'm elect. It's pride. The Lord has to break you. You can't be fixed unless you is broken, see. It is an issue of the heart. And God is looking for a broken heart. Not one that is puffed up because they simply believe. Or one that is, believes they are elect, chosen, without them having to do anything. Hmm. That sounds kind of civil, similar to the just believe crowd, doesn't it? Yeah, it does, doesn't it? And Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66. Verse 2, for all those things hath my, uh, let's read verse 1 and 2 in Isaiah 66. Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that ye build unto me? And where is the place of my rest? For all those things hath mine hand made, and all those things have been, saith the Lord. But to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. You got devils who say, well, the Lord knows your heart. And yeah, the Lord knows your heart. He sure does. Is it broken? He has to break you of your self-righteousness. That is your repentance. You cannot repent of your sins in order for him to save you. You can do that if you try. The repentance is Repenting of you're a good person. I'm not as bad as so and so. It's personal, not general. See. Least the fear of the Lord is brokenness and contrition. It's your fault that he went to the cross. It's my fault. But see, over 13 years ago, he broke me. <laughs> He broke me. Go to Samuel. 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel. Chapter 16. 1 Samuel. Chapter 16. One verse. Verse 7. Uh, let's read verse... Uh, 6 and 7 in 1 Samuel chapter 16. And it came to pass when they were come that he looked on Iliad and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Is your heart broken? Do you have godly sorrow? Are you sorry for what you did to the Lord and know that you can't save yourself? See, again, that's why people who uh, refute scriptural repentance, contrition, and calling upon the name of the Lord, they ain't saved. Because they, they, they don't get it. They have not been broken of themselves. Okay? Okay. Their hearts are hard. And go back to Isaiah 66. Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah chapter 66. Verse 18. For I know their works and their thoughts. It shall come 
that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. For I know their works and their thoughts. Ooh. What does that have to do with the heart? Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Verses 33 on to verse 35. <laughs> Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 on to verse 35. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. O oh, generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Oh, and so many can fake that. They could put on a facade of being so humble and quiet and flattering and so loving and nurturing and they seem so innocent. Yeah, yeah. Scratch them a little bit and see how they react. A good, oh, oh generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. He shall know them by their fruits. Many could put on a facade, but they always will expose themselves sooner or later. Every single time. Every single time. Every single time, boy. Luke, uh, Matthew chapter 15 now. Matthew chapter 15, verses 8 on to verse 20. Uh, let's begin at verse 7 in Matthew chapter 15. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. Matthew chapter 15, verses 17 on to verse 20. Uh, 7 on to verse 20, excuse me. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips. But their heart is far from me. And he's and that you can reference Isaiah chapter 29, verse 13 on that. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Like Roman Catholicism. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth the man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, that defileth the man. Defileth the man, excuse me. Like I said, a lot of these fakes, oh, they can talk in such a very nice, soft, quiet voice and sound so humble, so piteous, piteous so courteous, so gentle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a facade, boy. It's a facade. Hopefully y'all see that before it's too late. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees, a Pharisee is one who elevates tradition over scripture. That's a Catholic. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Willfully ignorant, you know, don't want to see the truth. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto this unto us this parable. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand? I, can't you just picture our Lord like, Oh, oy vey, oy vey. Come here. <laughs> that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draw. Use your imagination what he's talking about, okay? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the 
heart. And they defile the man. You watch, young man. Sooner or later, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. You watch. But then again, are you blind, being led by the blind? I hope not. I'm going to address that, by the way, in another video. Not today, but in another video. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. Isn't that funny? Out of the heart proceed evil thoughts. First thing mentioned, murders, <laughs> adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, false witness, excuse me, blasphemy. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. God is looking for a broken and contrite heart. Haven't that, hasn't that already been proven to you? And he has chosen the way of the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection. And that is your predestination. That is what is predestinated. And ultimately, the Lord knows who is going to be coming to him for him to save and those who are going to reject him. The Lord ultimately knows who are his and who are not. But see, as we looked at already in Isaiah chapter 53, even though he knows who's going to reject him and whom he is going to save, he still offers it. Remember, his ways are not our ways, people. Go to Luke chapter 16 now. Go to Luke chapter 16. We're almost done. Luke chapter 16, verses 13 on to verse 15. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Money. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You go find that. It's not money of the world. He says to come and buy without money and without price. And the Pharisees also who were covetous. Pharisee elevates tradition over scripture. <laughs> you could say Catholics. And the Pharisees also who were covetous heard all these things and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men. You justify yourselves before men. But God knoweth your hearts for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. Yes, God knows your heart. Yes. But go now to John chapter 2. John chapter 2. Verses 22 on to verse 25. John chapter 2, verses 22 on to verse 25. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, 
because he knew all men. And need not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 64, under verse 71. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. And that's not a predestination thing. It is God who does the saving. But see, you need to be broken and contrite. And people can fake that. But sooner or later, their true, unbroken, dark, vile, disgusting, deceitful heart will come out. From that time, many of his disciples walked back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? And look at how Peter answers. Then Shimon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Shimon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Finally, go to Hebrews chapter 4. And this is where we're going to end it. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Calvinism, uh, predestination as it is taught, is heresy, which could lead people into pride and it's, it's just such a mess. It's just such a mess. I believe uh, categorically, thank you, Lord, that we have gone through the scriptures today to prove to you otherwise. And beware of these Calvinists, such as John MacArthur and Justin Peters. Justin Freehold, or whatever his name is, Freehold, or whatever his name is, all these Calvinists out there who teach you predestination, that you are elect, that there are those who are elect going to heaven without their choice, with you know, at gunpoint, and those that are going to hell, elect to go to hell at gunpoint without any of their decision. God is not foreseeing anything upon you. Neither is the devil. Neither is the devil. So, that is going to be it for this video. Got more videos coming, of course. But um, this was, uh, like I said, praise the Lord, uh, brother sent me an email about this. And it's like, oh, wow, okay, Lord, okay. Uh, right now, I can't remember um, all the videos I said I was going to link in this. So if I forget one, uh, one of you moderators, please put it. If you would, it's, you know, it's not your job to watch after this channel. But um, 
got to remember <laughs> the videos that I said I was going to link in this. But it's going to be it for this one today. Thank you so much, all of you, those of the Church of the Living God, for all you have done. And may our Lord bless every single one of you of the Church of the Living God. Pray for one another. We love you. And we will see you in the next video.